This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Welcome viewers to thinktechhawaii.com. The show is the will of the people and I am your host, Martha E. Randolph. Today we will be discussing the nonviolent protest movements of the past and their effectiveness in causing change compared to more recent protest movements or demonstrations and why they accomplished more in the past than they do now and how they differ in organization. My guest today, I'm happy to say, is the professor of political science, Brian Hallett, who is part of the Matsunaga Institute for Peace at the University of Hawaii. I can't even say the university. That's terrible. University of Hawaii. He teaches a number of courses for that, and uh, it's under Peace and Conflict Resolution Studies, which is PACE, if any of you are interested. One of the courses I took with Professor Halliott was the course on nonviolent protest, exploring Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and other events. He also teaches a course on the meaning of war, which will be taught uh, next semester, I believe. And he used to be, or the mes semester after. And he was a soldier during the Vietnam War, and it caused him to become interested in the causes of war. So welcome, Professor Hallett. Thank you for being on my show. I'm very grateful. Yeah, well, very happy to be here. OK, well, let's get right into it. Uh, we do know that the protests of the past, the demonstrations, were movements. And they caused significant change. The civil rights movement, the peace in Vietnam movement, um, basically not having people have to be drafted, and many other things were involved. They, we are protests today don't seem to work as effectively. They're on for a few minutes, they're off, and nothing seems to change. Why might that be? What is going on? Well, I, I, the most important thing to start off with is to, to define terms. And I make a distinction as, of a protest, which is giving voice to the voiceless. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're giving voice to the voiceless, you've been successful as soon as you've gotten your message out. And to think that, that uh, th there would be consequences immediately beyond giving voice to the voiceless uh, is just not to understand a, a, a protest. What made Gandhi and King so successful is that they did more than protest. Okay, in they, what way, yeah. They, they had campaigns. And the, the way uh, Martin Luther King uh, uh, explained it is that first of all he was he was not protesting he was doing a demonstration he demonstrated simultaneously what the injustice was and he demonstrated what the solution was the paradigmatic example is the nashville uh, lunch counter sit-ins in 1960. so the injustice was that uh, black customers could not go to the lunch counters and have a uh, tuna fish sandwich and a chocolate milk well, that's a great injustice. Uh, <clears throat> the remedy for that injustice was to sit on a stool at the lunch counter, ask for a tuna fish sandwich and a talk at malt, and when it was not given to you, you just stay there until you get served or thrown out, as the, mm. as the case would be. So that, that what they did was not just protest. They simultaneously demonstrated what the problem was and what the remedy was. And was that true also of Gandhi when he sure. had his great, sure. basically, removal from the uh, British Empire movement, yeah? yeah. Independence. Well, at, at key moments, the, the um, critical moment, of, of course, is the 1933 um, assault march. So he, he marched 260 miles uh, to the sea and he made salt. Mm -hmm. So what did this demonstrate? <clears throat> First of all, this demonstrated an injustice because the salt tax uh, provided a quarter of the government of India revenue, but it was paid by the poor people. It was an incredibly regressive tax. Mm. And what's the remedy to, an, to a, a regressive tax on salt? Well, the remedy is to make salt and give it to people. I mean, so he, he demonstrated the, the injustice he demonstrated simultaneously the, the solution, and he, because it was a march of a very large number of people, 
he demonstrated that the Indian National Congress had the organization to, to actually do really. this. And I think that's also true with the uh, civil rights movement yes. and the anti-Vietnam War movement. Wherever they started, they grew to be quite large. Uh, there was also a lot of planning. There seemed to be a sequential series of events yeah. where you went out and said what the problem was. And if you did not get a resolution, then you went out again. But you, if you couldn't show them yeah. the problem and the answer, you said to them, this is the answer I want. And eventually, uh, it seems that politicians were paying attention, at least in those days. They were more impressed by several hundred thousand people getting out on the street and saying, this is what we want. Now, um, the women's movement originally had that kind of impetus. Right now, there are additional women's movements, for example, but they don't seem to be causing consistent change. They bring things to your attention, but they're not causing change. What might the significant differences be between these uh, Occupy Wall Street, uh, protest against the world financial situation, and the current, uh, the time is now, or now it ends now, the, the women's movement that rose up to say, we're gonna talk about this. Yeah. It's got a publicity, yeah. but have we caused change? Well, you see, one of the implications when, when you talk about demonstration in the sense that King did, is that some problems can be demonstrated and other problems can't be demonstrated. So <clears throat> during King's lifetime, the, the great example was when he went from the South up to Chicago and they were going to protest against the, uh, the, the, the housing segregation um, in, Ch in Chicago, which was very blatant and, mm. and very obvious. <clears throat> and it didn't work, it didn't work. The point is, how do you demonstrate housing segregation? Mm. Yes, you know, I in, the you know, And the remedy to housing segregation is to have uh, the minority people buy houses in, in, you know, in, in white areas. Right. Yeah. But of course, to buy a house takes, well, back then it takes, what, $30,000, $40,000? Well, it took money that the people didn't have. The, yeah, and, and so you cannot demonstrate the solution. You cannot demonstrate the solution to housing segregation and the problem in, at, at the same time. It's a different kind of problem that requires different kind of solutions. Specifically, it requires legislation. Exactly, yeah. And a fair housing law and a... And a uh, uh, an agency that oversees fair housing and what and some form of enforcement yeah I exactly. mean it's it's you can have laws up the yin-yang but if they're not being enforced right. as we've seen happens right. often here in yeah. Hawaii it's just a bunch of empty words so consequently the the remedy to to what well, I, I should say not just housing but also economic hmm. uh, pay injustices uh, the inequality of distribution of wealth in the United States and around the world uh, these require legislative electoral politics. So you, 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 you have to be organized to elect the people who will put into place the law and the enforcement to, to solve these economic problems. So there's a class of social problems that can be demonstrated, uh, and civil rights was obviously one of those. Uh, independence of India was one of those. Uh, the end of apartheid in, in S South Africa was another one. But the economic issues just can't be handled that way. True, true. The other thing is we're using the term nonviolent protest, and right. I'm going to have a break soon, but we've discussed the fact that the, you can't really use that term because no. the demonstrations were certainly not intended to cause harm to outside people, but many of the participants did suffer great violence, right, yeah? Right. Well, you, you see, the problem with, with, the, with the terms violent and nonviolent is that you can only uh, talk about violence and nonviolence after the demonstration is over. Ah. So no one ever planned a violent 
uh, demonstration. Uh, if you planned a violent demonstration, it wouldn't be a, a it would be a revolution, wouldn't well, it? <laughs> well, it'd be an attack. It'd be an yeah. attack. I mean, that's what they did in, in Charlotte, Virginia recently. Really? They attacked people. Um, and th a, a, a protest always begins as nonviolent. Uh, and because of the circumstances and the people who are opposed to the protests, the protests may become violent. So that the news broadcasts in the evening is going to say there was a violent protest. Yes, exactly. And when we come back from break, I do want to discuss some of the events we've seen overseas because they tend to be aggressive protests. The ones in France recently yeah. were hardly what I would call nonviolent. Um, and there have been other similar events in Europe. Yeah. They get much more aggressive, but then they're older and they've been doing dealing with this stuff for a long time. So I'd like to discuss that as well. Um, for the moment, I'm going to take a quick break because if we don't, I'm going to get stuck with you in the middle of a wonderful response. So ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be a short break in our show and then we will come back with Professor Hallett and we will talk more about this. This is a subject that would go on for quite some time, but we're going to do what we can. So we'll see you shortly on The Will of the People. This is Martha E. Randolph. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Choose to treat it with the help of a physical therapist. Physical therapists treat pain through movement and exercise. No warning labels required, and you get to actively participate in your care choose to improve your health without the risks of opioids. Choose physical therapy. Hello everybody, this is Martha Randolph on the Will of the People for ThinkTechHawaii.com. My guest today is Professor Brian Hallett and we are talking about what we usually refer to as nonviolent protest for the cause of political change in the world and why it has been different in the past than it is now. When we went to break, Dr. Hallett and myself were about to talk about the differences between protests we've seen in the news recently in Europe, uh, in France, we've seen them in Greece, we've seen them in Italy, which tend to be violent. They are not even pretending to be a peaceful demonstration. And why they go that way over there, and we usually at least start with a group of people marching peacefully regardless of their emotional commitment to the cause. So what is going on? Why are we so different? Well, I, I think it's a cultural historical. Uh, the, in the United States, uh, except for the Boston Tea Party, mm. uh, most protests are, are exactly that, protests. They, they organize and they want to give voice to the voiceless. Um, in, in France in particular, and, and other European countries, uh, the, they have a different culture uh, and they uh, react very, very physically. Uh, the farmers drive their tractors and the, the uh, truck drivers park in the middle of the road and, right. and don't let anybody through and, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, but the critical point, I think, is that, that, that these protests that, that appear on television to be very uh, aggressive and violent, all they're doing, they're not part of a, of a campaign. They're, okay. They're, they're, they're voicing an opinion, and that's all they're doing. Is there leadership involved, or is this more spontaneous? Well, th there's a hard core that that organize these the uh, these events actually in the recent uh, demonstrations or uh, protests in france are really interesting because they're taking place in november when it's cold and the protest season in france is always may when the, <laughs> when the weather is much much better <laughs> well of course because if you're going to have a protest it's nice if the weather's lovely yeah you should have it on a sunny day but uh uh they're not parts of campaigns. They're 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 people who are semi-professional protesters. Okay. And they organize these events around you know different uh, different causes, 
uh, and, and people show up, and sometimes they're successful and sometimes they're not. Um, they do tend to cause notice, though. I mean, yeah. I've noticed that governments that are experiencing these kinds of protests do recognize they must address them right. in some way. Right. Um, the civil rights movement and the peace movement, from my memory, were addressed because they were long-standing. They just didn't go away. They kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. But these days, you have a protest, as it were, uh, like the yeah. Occupy Wall Street. Yeah. It gets a little coverage, and it's generally peaceful, but then something changes, and it has to do with the way it's covered on television, and I think it also has to do with the way the counter forces infiltrate the protest and try to turn it into something that could be violent, which would be great for television, but does not accomplish any goal. Right. Um, have you seen that? And how important is organization and goal setting when you want to create a movement that will cause specific change? Well, you, you, you cannot cause specific change without a movement that's well organized. Mm. And the key to the organization, as, as King uh, said over and over again, is to have the coherence of your ends and means. You establish a goal, and then you develop means that will actually get you to that goal. Um, <clears throat> like in, a five-year plan <laughs> in the old days, yeah? Well, no, it's, 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 it begins with an analysis of the problem. And you know, to, to go back previously, economic issues cannot be demonstrated. Right. So that the civil rights type of, of protest uh, just doesn't work for, for economic issues. Uh, you have to do legislation and, and, and other things. Uh, the anti-Vietnam War movement, one of the, the, the uh, principal reasons it was successful is that the war in Vietnam was just plain nonsense. It couldn't. Uh, uh, it, it just couldn't be justified right. after a certain period of time. In addition, we did have the Ellsberg Papers. We had the release to the public of information that exposed the, the lack of yeah. sanity behind that movement, which I've noticed they don't let it happen anymore. I think, sadly, the government forces learned from that to make the underlying story very secure. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, going back to France, uh, Macron and his government Im impose a new gasoline tax, which it, uh, hits the pack the pocketbook of virtually everyone, right? Uh, and especially low-income people. And th this was the fuse that set off the the, uh, the a protest against economic injustice in in general in France. Uh, and the government has to respond to it because the, the, uh, the, the injustice is just so blatant and, and, and uh, it, it has to be addressed. It's true. It's true. I, we have noticed that worldwide there seems to be an increase in extreme right-wing thinking. Right. Um, I would call it a resurgence, but you can't repeat the exact past. You go forward into something that brings up things that happened in the past. I don't know if it's a disconnect with the actual history of right-wing thinking or if there is a legitimate complaint because in an effort to be fair, some governments and some leaders have not really seen the overall effect. In the situation where people are protesting migration or immigration, in situations where basically people are fleeing for their lives and they don't want to leave their home, they don't see any choice, that imposes on the people in the country they're fleeing to. What is an answer here? Because all I can think of is you unite as a world and you go back to the countries that are screwing up and you overthrow them and try to create a government where you can say to the people, you can go back now, we're gonna give you more money yeah and we're going to help rebuild you, and that's fine. But we don't think that way as a yeah. world, do we? No, no, no. I mean, the, the immigration is, is driven by a number of economic and, and uh, uh, conflict reasons. Uh, so if you want to stop 
the, 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 the refugees, you have to solve the original problem. Right. And uh, both in the United States and Europe, uh, you just can't have that discussion. Uh, it's, it's too rational, is what it is. Mm -hmm. the, the, the emotion of just being against other people is so much stronger uh, than, than, than the rational approach. I mean, we, we would have to tax ourselves uh, a little bit in order to have the foreign uh, aid that would, that would solve some of these problems. And the foreign aid, I think, would have to be applied with some yeah, cleverness, some real understanding, right. because we have money and we have thrown it at nations before. Right. Unfortunately, that money tends to go into the pockets of a controlling force and never gets down to the people and doesn't get used the way we were hoping it would. Yeah. So money by itself is not the problem. It's the intention of how it is used. And it seems to me we are confronting a very new situation where certain specific countries are taking actions which are going to cause damage to other countries, and those countries don't seem to have the power to do anything, such as global warming. Yeah. Uh, we're going into a new era. Now, in this era, is there any way to use the protest techniques of the past, the demonstration or movement techniques of the past, to cause some kind of change? Because one of the other things we seem to be missing are powerful, charismatic leadership, or leaders, you yeah, know, yeah. groups of leaders, yeah? Well, uh, it, it, it's a fraught question whether we need a, a charismatic leader in order to lead a movement or not. It seems to me that it, it's, it's easier if you do have a charismatic leader, but if you don't, you still have to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, I think the missing element in, in a lot of the protest movements is that they are not paying attention to the electoral part of, a, of our government. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we, over the past 10 years, we have allowed the state legislatures to, to gerrymander. Mm -hmm. If we had been paying attention and electing, uh, you know, officials that, that had a bigger uh, commitment to fair elections, there would be no gerrymandering. All right. So attention, I think, is often focused on the wrong, the, the wrong problem. If we could fix the electoral problem, then we could fix the economic injustice issues, then we could fix the, the global warming, you know, have a tax on carbon, uh, uh, subsidize uh, solar and wind and, right. and you know, r research into other types of energy. So it, well, it is true. We've had recently had elections which show that even in the face of blatant untruths and behavior which can only be described as bullying, yeah. there are still people in America who will support the election of an individual and his supporters uh, to continue in behavior like that, which is interesting because they probably wouldn't accept it in the schoolyard. Yeah. Um, that requires an informed public. It requires an electorate that actually researches information and thinks, but it seems the electorate is voting more on emotion now than ever before. Yeah. Yeah. And there are things happening now that I haven't seen happen in the last 50 years. Uh, for people like ourselves who've been through the civil rights movement, I haven't seen this many African Americans killed by police who were completely innocent, who, unjustly, and the police get away with it since the 50s and the 60s when it was open season. The only difference is these are in police uniforms instead of in white outfits with cones on their heads. Um, and they don't make a statement about it, they just do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so is, is it possible to have a political situation which will resolve itself? And we're coming to the end of this, so let's see what we can end with that might be a positive note or at least a question people can think about. Well, Trump has, has captured 35 to 40 percent of the American population. And that 35 or 40 percent uh, is totally dedicated to whatever he, he wants to do at the moment. 
That means that uh, 60 or 65 percent of the American public doesn't agree with it. But the 65 percent is not organized. They're not organized. They're fragmented. They're fragmented into feminist groups. They're fragmented into ec different economic groups, different you know, uh, identity groups, and so on and so forth. And as long <coughs> as the opposition is, I mean, the rule is divide and conquer, right? Right, of course. And as long as the opposition, as long as the 60% of the population uh, is divided, then it, they can't possibly beat. Okay. So is, is what King did, is, well, in Montgomery in the first place, he got all the Christian ministers to agree to do one thing at one time, uh, boycott the bus. Now, the, the Christian ministers uh, in, in, well, Christian ministers in, in general disagree with each other. So my sect is better than your sect and right. so on and right. so forth. But how do we bring, I mean, is it's what King did is he brought these people who disagreed on the most fundamental theological questions, which for ministers is big is, deal. Is big deal. <laughs> he got them to work together. And is what we're looking for is someone who will bring the 60% of the population together. Franklin Roosevelt did this in the 1930s. Absolutely. And, and uh, Kennedy seemed to engender a great deal of public. And of course, Barack Obama was a shock and surprise. Yeah. But it seems to me we go back to the nature of leadership. And I'm sorry to say it, but Trump has a certain charisma. Mm -hmm. And obviously enough to cause people to completely dismiss the things he does and says that make no sense yeah, yeah. and decide that it's okay. Um, well, he's it, got 40%. He's got 40%. But <clears throat> the 60% have to get organized. That's true. And actually within the 40%, there are people who I really think are not thinking. Because oh, yeah. I'd like to think that 40% of the United States of America are not bully supporters, are not blatant liars, and are not quite that racist anymore or anti-female anymore. But I don't know. So we've come to the end of this show. Okay. And obviously this is something we could approach again. Dr. Halliott is teaching his course on the meaning of war. So, uh, that will be coming up in next year, right? In the right. fall in the 2019. Fall semester. fall semester 2019. For those of you who are over 60, you can attend it for free. Uh, look into the Nakapuna program. And for those of you who simply want to learn something that you didn't know you need to know, please, I suggest you take this course. So ladies and gentlemen, we are at the end of this particular lecture. Thank you, Dr. Hallett, for My coming pleasure. along. And we are also at the end of a year and we are approaching holidays. We all know what that means. So I want to wish all of you, on behalf of my staff and this show and thinktechhawaii.com, a very happy holiday season. Merry Christmas, happy Kwanzaa, happy Hanukkah. We could sing all sorts of songs. My brother liked to sing uh, you know, Silent Night when we lit the Hanukkah candles. He was confused at the time, but I want you to have a wonderful holiday season. And when the new year comes, participate. There's a new legislative session coming in Hawaii. There are many organizations that are pushing very important bills. Look into them. Find out what you can do because they need your support. All right. Thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you in the new year. Thank you, Professor Holly. Thank you. Merry Christmas.